All right. Well, we're still waiting from folk, for folks from the uh, board, but hopefully they should be wrapping up pretty soon here. One thing that I did want to bring up to the group is that um, I started reading a paper and uh, I thought it would be an interesting one for our group here to discuss. So um, take a look and see if, if, if you think this would be uh, interesting for us. Uh, this is from FAST22 and um, it's a, a research group that uh, w went and implemented uh, transactions on F2FS. Uh, I think they used uh, the same API that has been previously used for um, implementing file system transactions, um, but they they did some clever things uh, beyond that. So um, anyway, uh, if folks are interested, I thought maybe at a future meeting we could we could take a look at this paper. All right, so. Uh, move on to PRs this week. Uh, not a whole lot of movement. Um, I see that uh, Adam uh, from CORE uh, did review Igor's uh, StatFS update PR um, and he approved that, so that looks good. But should you just go through testing now, uh, but I think otherwise is uh, in good shape. And then the Jaeger tracing PR. Um, thank you, Gabby, for helping Dipika on that. Um, the results look pretty good. Uh, even on a faster OSD, the impact was fairly minimal. So I agree that uh, it looks like uh, this is reasonable to compile in by default. Um, maybe not turn on by default, although the impact there looked pretty small too, surprisingly. So. Um, in any event, uh, it, it looks like it's a worthy inclusion. Um, so beyond that, not a whole lot of movement on things. There's uh, this buffer bloat mitigation PR that Sam needs to review. He just got back from PTO, so I think that's on his list of things to do. Um, I need to go back and still review this uh, BT PR for Tithology, uh, apparently it broke a while back uh, because there was old output directory data that um, CBT just won't, won't overwrite it, it refuses to do so. Uh, so I just uh, had the Tithology task clean it out beforehand. And I, I think that's all right, um, but apparently there are still some results missing that we need to figure out what that is. Uh, Otherwise, I think there are a couple of MDS reviews that um, that were done, um, but not a whole lot of new movement on that. Um, I think at least one of them we're waiting to hear back from uh, uh, from you, Colonel, on on that. I think I just didn't have that in there before. Yeah, I've got a couple in here actually that I need to go back and and figure out what to do with um, this time-based adaptive near-fit algorithm. One is less important now that we found the other more prominent root cause of the issue with the uh, the the allocator on these Samsung drives. Um, that's more or less fixed. This could could be added, but it's it's not that big of a deal, I think, at this point. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. Um, anything I missed from anyone? Oh, I see, Matt, you, you commented on the Jaeger changes. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think they can. I approved it. Um, I don't know if there's anything else anyone else wants to do to look at it before then, but, um, but it's, it's fine from what I've seen so far. I think it's got a couple of approvals at this point, Matt. Uh, 
All right. So, um, yeah, was there anything I missed from anyone? All right. Well, then, um, moving on. Let's see, wow, I don't know if we have the core folks yet. They must be deep in discussion. Well, um, I guess the first update that I will give is that uh, there isn't a whole lot of new info on Igor's blue store right ahead log. He's on holiday right now. Um, kind of the, the current status of it is that we still need to figure out um, a couple of issues that, that it has. Um, remember, one of them was just that it, it was, There's a bug where um, it doesn't think there's enough space on the right ahead log partition. And so in some cases it was failing to deploy the OSD. Uh, the, the OSD just refused to start. Uh, so that's something that needs to be fixed. And there was a couple of other uh, things, but uh, surprisingly overall it worked really, really well. Uh, as, so, so long as the OSD would start up. Um, so kind of related to that, as an offshoot of that, I started looking into um, the behavior of the classic OSD when there are, well, basically when you, you get rid of the, the right ahead log, get rid of all PG log updates to, to just kind of focus in on um, how are, are the OSD scales as you change messenger threads and you change shards and TPOSD TP threads? There was some kind of surprising and interesting uh, behavior. I'm going to quick, I realize I didn't share this yet, so I'll do so now. Uh, in the chat window here. I can also share my screen, I guess. That probably would make sense. Um, and window. And I can uh, make this a little smaller so that it's more visible. Um, is that like a reasonable size? Can people? People see it. That's good. See here, uh, Mark. Could you please explain it? Okay. So, so Gabby, um, last week Igor and I sat down to to test and, and examine the behavior of his his blue store red head log, and so um, we went through and did that, and it, it, it's actually pretty impressive. Um, uh, it can it, typically, I think we can get at least 20% out of it and might be able to get up to 50% out of it, but that, that will take more work, I think. But, um, but so as an offshoot of that testing, um, this week I've been looking at if we get rid of the PG log essentially, um, or at least take out all the calculations for it, and we remove the redhead log, so that's not in the way, then what does the behavior of the classic OSD look like? when we start changing the number of shards and the number of threads per shard and the number of messenger threads. So, um, so uh, Mark, just to, to make clear, you don't test moving PG log to a new model where we only put it in the right ahead log. You, you are testing and, and not inserting this into mem table, you are testing getting rid of PG log, which is of course impossible to do just like this. Exactly, exactly. It's not for, for um, uh, you know, necessarily a realistic number, but more I want to examine the scaling behavior of the OSD code as we change the number of shards and the number of threads when, when PG log isn't a factor. Does that make sense? Yes. So, um, what's very interesting that I started seeing is that 
when you have contention uh, on the messenger thread, only one messenger thread, um, we see that uh, as the number of shards increases, uh, both the performance and the uh, efficiency of the OSD degrades significantly. So in this uh, one I'm looking at here, cycles per op, <clears throat> you can see that um, when you only have two shards and you have a lot of threads per shard, but only one messenger thread, that um, we have about twice as many, nearly twice as many cycles per op uh, compared to uh, kind of the best case scenarios. Uh, again, sorry, which one are you showing? I'm seeing 114. Oh, oh sorry, this one. Yep. Uh, so, okay. so when we have uh, few shards and lots of threads per shard, so in this case, if we look at the 24 threads, so that would be um, 12 uh, threads per shard, but only one messenger thread. The uh, efficiency of the OSD, OSD degrades significantly, as does the performance. Okay, so now what happens if we look at two messenger threads? Well, we see a similar scenario play out. It's better, the performance doubles, um, but we see the same kind of trend where um, as we have more shards, uh, sorry, as we have, when we have few shards, performance is bad, and we have more shards is better. Although, so far in these tests, it's not quite as good as when we had fewer shards um, in this, or in fewer threads overall. Sorry. Um, what are the we see when, you, when you're showing 125,000, is this OPS per shard? Uh, sorry, this is IOPS. Uh, so 125,000 IOPS, this is 4K random write. Okay, that's a good number. Exactly, exactly, right? So get rid of the write-ahead log, get rid of the PG log, and we see that that's, you know, significantly higher than it is, uh, you know, just with standard, you know, main, uh, the main branch right now, you know, where we get maybe more like 80. But only when you have eight threads and more. Uh, it, yeah, like uh, 12, 12 threads to 16 threads looked like it was kind of the, the sweet spot with, you know, like between three and six shards. But then when we had more after that, then then there was like the performance started to degrade fairly What's significantly. The number? What do we, how many threads do we have today? Right now, the, the, the standard configuration is eight shards with two threads per shard. So this this uh, one I have highlighted right now. Okay, so that's the base configuration. Yep. And you're saying that actually using four shard with, with three threads per shard would give us more numbers. Yeah, yeah, or, or, four, or four threads per shard as well. Like, you know, anything in this kind of range here or this one looked like it was a little bit better. But what I'm interested in is why we see this, this really, really bad behavior when we have few shards, um, but it doubles as we increase the messenger threads. It looks to me like when the TPOSD TP threads are contending on the messenger threads that, um, that, that they start behaving badly, that they start blocking. So I need to, to understand that more. But, um, but we can see that, uh, like before here, the, the cycles per op numbers are bad as well. So we spend more cycles when we contend on the messenger thread, I think is what that says. So my, my, my instinct here would be, okay, well, if this is the case, maybe if we study this, maybe if we understand why that's happening, maybe we can even help these other situations that are, are good, right? Like maybe it's not that 
there's no contention, but maybe it's that there's just much less contention in those scenarios. So maybe we can still even do better than this. So unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot more than what I'm showing you here. Um, so, so Mark, so we have these numbers showing the IEPS, but how about uh, efficiency? Uh, I've seen before that you had some <clears throat> table about efficiency. Yes. I mean, isn't I'm not surprised that 24 threads behaves badly. Like that's why we have two why we default to two threads per shard, right? Like we looked at the ratio of work done in the different threads and that was about the right number. So in this case, you're running like, you know, eight threads per shard and the IOs are small. So there's not a lot of work to be done per IO and they're feeding into the same, probably the same number of blue store threads and and like the messenger thread still needs to re like write out the same or the messenger still needs to write out the same number of replies. You're just, this is way too many threads for the amount of work that the rest of the system can drive. Is that surprising? Greg, I think it's surprising that when you go from 16 to 24 TPOs, DTP threads with two messenger threads, you're getting like about half the, the throughput, half the IOPS. That seems surprising that you I mean, see I'm, that faster I'm, drop I'm off. I'm surprised it's that bad, but like, there's just there's a lot of lock intention going on, and lock intention and cash line bounces have a lot of pernicious effects. So, I don't. I, know. I, oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm oh. surprised at the magnitude, but not, but like the this is what I would expect to see in in terms of shape. <laughs> it's the magnitude that interests me, and what also interests me is that whether or not we still have that even in the good case and whether or not we can minimize that to get better numbers even even at the peak here like you know we we've got okay kind of a sweet spot here it looks like right but can we do better than that sweet spot is is what i'm wondering Do, do you I mean, think that's reasonable, Greg? I mean, it's just sort of like, that's why you study how your system behaves, but see, there are lots of different CPU designs. Like this is, like there's not, not one true right answer. There's just, how does it, how does it, how does it behave in, in different scenarios? And you, and you find, and, and you try that out and then configure it, I guess. Well, that's, that's the whole point of this, right? You know, like, we, we oh, look okay. at this, this yeah. okay. <laughs> right? Like, that's, that's what we're doing. You know, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the um, other thing is like, you know, you've, you've ripped a lot of the workout that's doing it. So I'm not surprised that they look a little bit different. Like, you know, the PG log is a lot of work. And when you're not doing 4K IOs, then there's more, more kinds of work. And so, I, yeah. may, maybe there's a lesson to be learned here, but I think the lesson, but, but what I'm seeing here is, yeah, cash line cont or like lock contention and cash line bouncing is bad. So you should try to avoid yeah. that. And, you know, Seth as a whole is not great at that. And so Crimson exists, but like the way we normally run is a lot better at it than, than the extremes you outlined here with the 24 thread scenarios. What I'm, um, one of the things that, that I've I've kind of toyed with over the years is looking at whether or not using a a, a luckless uh, queue implementation um, might be worth trying versus the sharded up work queue. So that's that's kind of one of the reasons I wanted to look at this a little bit is to see if it makes any sense to even try prototyping it. With current configuration, if you run the same test with write ahead log and with PG log, what uh, would be the equivalent numbers? Where is the sweet spot? It's roughly around eighty thousand IOPS, if I remember correctly, on this on this hardware. But 
Uh, how does it change between shards and threads? Ah, I don't have that yet. I'm good. I, it's on my list to do. Um, I will have it, but I just don't have the numbers at this point. But I agree with you. That's that's one of the things I also want to look at is when we when we put the PG log back in um, and Red Hat log back in. Although PG log is more interesting because that happened. That's much more impactful on the um, the TPOSDTP threads and the messenger thread, whereas well is primarily limiting the KV sync thread. Um, what happens, right? Like, how does that affect the contention? Um, so, any, yeah, I agree with you. It would be very interesting to, to get those numbers. Well. So, um, Greg, you, meant, you mentioned Crimson, and I agree with you that that's the, the right long-term uh, answer, I think. Uh, it's just a question of uh, what what we want to do in the meantime, and if it's worth doing anything at all or not. Gabby, were you were you going to say something else? Sorry, I, I might have. No, no, no. I was thinking about something. I was looking to, uh, this week together with uh, Josh Darding in Snap Delete, which is the equivalent of PGLog, right? It's something that we control and we initiate IO. When we delete PGLog, we always do 100 of them at a time because we want to save the right ahead log access, right? If we do 100 PGLog delete in a single transaction, then we create a single right ahead log entry. Yes. When we do snap delete, which is essentially the same thing, we have the full control, we can decide how much we do, and we have the code to do this, we put the limit on two. Why was that? I have no idea. I don't think anyone's really looked at the, the, the snap delete code in a long because it seems that somebody put a lot of effort in creating the code to create transactions, but then they set uh, the max number to two, which is, it, it probably means somebody was looking, uh, otherwise I can't imagine why this thing happened. Because you, it's much harder to do the code if you had transaction, but you have it. Now, moving from two to 20 to 100, like the PG log, is just changing one counter. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know, Gabby, why, why it was set to two. Um, actually, was that, which was that, is, config, but go ahead. So I'm saying another interesting thing when we're testing with no right ahead log is to see snap deletions, when we delete the snap, how does it behave without write ahead log? Is the write ahead log really the, the cost or it's somewhere else? Sure. I mean, I would, I, I think in the past hasn't a, the primary cost been the, the iteration piece when you're doing snapshot deletion? Iteration of the tables? Yeah. I'm trying to remember how that code looks. I looked at it once and then didn't look at it again. It's pretty heavy, the code making decision, because you have to work from the snap to the object node. But still, that's only CPU. I would expect that generating right ahead log uh, transactions, that would be much more expensive. Especially because it's done synchronously, so you've been waiting it, on, on on the SSD. It was it was the iteration over the tombstones that that has shown up a lot in the past, I think. Oh, I mean, but that's ex uh, so. So my thinking is that deleting a snapshot is essentially the same problem like deleting PG log. Could right? be. Because in PGLog, we create them, and then they're just going to be deleted in big bulks, and tombstones are very expensive. 
And when we look SNAP, it's essentially the same things. You're generating a lot of tombstones. The, when you delete snapshots, though, that might happen a, a, a really, I mean, it can happen with pglog too, but that doesn't, isn't the typical behavior that might be deleted far in the future? Sorry, yeah, you delete them far in the future, but when you delete them, you generate a lot of tombstones. And if we suspect that the pglog cost stems from the tombstone, then snap deletion might have the same problem. And if we could fix one of them, then you can fix the other. Because ego, uh, and, and now I try to bring my point, ego's right ahead log allow us to do the delete without, um, in, a, in a much cheaper way. Sorry. It's, it's right ahead log can, can make things much faster. It, it does, um, but, but it does not fix the problem yet of, um, Passing through uh, deleted PG log entries into the database, right? Like it, it doesn't fix the problem where um, if you have a short lived entry, like for a PG log um, update, uh, you still will have a lot of write amplification in the database if you make the mem table small. So it doesn't fix that yet. Yes, that's true. And we can do that with PG log, but I don't think we can do that with snapshot deletion, right? Probably right, because we do need the snaps to be held somewhere for later. It still will probably be better though, but just we can't do that. Yeah. But it's still worthwhile just changing the constant from two into 100 or into 50 and see how snap deletions impact the system. I suppose that you have uh, some wasted space, right? Like if you keep 100 snapshots around. No, 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 I'm saying like every, every delete now is deleting two entries. Yeah. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah, okay, never mind. Yeah, you're right. I think you delete two snap entries and two object nodes associated with them. So it means the transaction have four entries inside it. But yeah, yeah. Conditions, you put 100 entries. So I would try and go for up from two into 50, which will be the equivalent, meaning 100 entries inside one transaction. Yeah. You know, I suspect that maybe the, the rationale behind that was maybe uh, not to hit the database very hard. Maybe the thought was that if you only do two at once, then um, the impact would be less, but I don't know. That's just a guess. Why would the impact be less? Because we generate less, but, but it just means the whole system is much. You could weave in other stuff, right? Like if you don't, you know, hammer the database with these big, um, these big updates, but I, I don't think it's true. I think but maybe that. Head log, right? Because you keep sending entries each time it's like do four entries, four entries, four entries. Uh, yeah. It'd be better for it to do a bigger range. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think it's actually would be much better behavior. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, uh, guess at the maybe why, why the thought why you maybe would do small ones, you know, uh, a, a larger number of small ones. Maybe the thought was that it would interleave with, with IO better. Yeah, so if you try from 2 to like 10, 20, up to 50, like maybe 10, 25, and 50, and see where the switch goes. Maybe they're already going to show us that performance is going to be degraded, so I'll start with them. Yeah, Gabby, I think that's a good idea. I think, I think you should definitely uh, try it and see what happens. Are you, um, is this related to the RB mirror work that Paul has been yes. looking at? Because in RBD mirroring, one of our problems is that to be able to the mirroring, you create snapshots. So we keep creating snapshots and deleting them. Every uh -huh. So there's a lot of snap deletions associated with RBD mirroring. Yeah, yeah. So RBD mirroring, I think every 15 minutes, 
you generate a new snapshot, you sync it, and then you delete it. Okay. Okay. And I think the snapshot deletion causes spikes in performance. Yes. Yes. I I believe so. We see it in other contexts. Um, one thing Paul did as well um, is he used smaller objects uh, as a test and that, that seemed to improve the behavior that he saw um, fairly significantly. Uh, I think the thought is that when you're doing small uh, changes to big objects, that it requires um, a, you know, fairly significant right amplification to um, you know, uh, uh, deal with objects as a whole. How far away are we from Igor's uh, code being uh, tried to, to be merged in the tree? It... Well, uh, you know, it, it worked pretty well. There are some bugs, but um, overall it, was, it worked surprisingly well. But, um, you know, it would, it would need to go through the full test, test suite and there'd need to be well, I don't know. I, we'd have to decide how we would want that to actually work when, if a user were to deploy it for real, right? Like, what's the the process of taking an existing OSD and switching to this new right ahead log scheme? Like, do you, do you need to be able to convert an existing OSD? How does that conversion work? I think that that would be you know part of what we'd need to figure out. And what kind of performance benefit did we observe, or did this something this you already showed last week? Oh, um, well, uh, it's in the, the Etherpad. Um, let me let me pull it up. Um, second. It in the chat window and I'll, I'll put it in that other uh, shared window as well. Um, so like here we've got um, you see the stock uh, numbers and then um, these other headings in the different columns. Um, the that, stock that, that's the M2 NT2X64 was that's um, two 64 megabyte mem tables. That's shrinking the mem tables. Okay. So we get the performance advantage with the high write amplification. Okay, and blue wall, blue right ahead log, that's Igor stuff? Yes, that's Igor stuff. So that's a two gigabyte right ahead log. And um, we, uh, we flush uh, when it's half full. And then the next column, eight gigabyte right ahead log, and we flush when it's 80% full. And what's what's really interesting, the biggest number that we saw was actually when we um, we have uh, a, a big red head log, we, f we wait to flush it until it's very full, and we have the small mem table sizes. We see a very big performance gain, but it's the highest amount of right amplification as well. And I think we know, right? We, we, we knew that shrinking the mem table is, is making the system more efficient in insertion into the mem table, but we pay dearly with uh, right amplification. So it's not it, more. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but the gain was really big, even bigger than in the past sometimes, right? Um, yeah, it's like almost yeah, it's like double the gain than what we had before. Yeah, so it's a, a really big gain. Um, but we can still get some gain uh, with low right amplification just by um, uh, using his right ahead log and the existing mem table sizes. We can still get a nice nice benefit. It's, yeah. it's almost as good as stock with small mem tables. Yeah, it's like 20%. Yeah, twenty percent gain. That's very nice. And then, yeah. if we hack PG log, 
to only go to the right ahead log, but don't enter, don't insert them into the main table. Just maintain your own cyclic buffer. Exactly. Then you have another 20 something percent performance increase waiting for you. Yep. Yep. And that, that was what I was trying to convince Igor that that's the next thing we should do is try to see if we could, um, uh, just keep the PG log entries in his, uh, in his uh, Red Hat log, or, or or keep track of them, and um, and see if there's some way that we can can uh, do a better job of of keeping them out of the database for longer. So not don't even send them to RocksDB uh, unless unless they um, they get too old. Yeah, that's really nice. So yeah, uh, I, there's, it looks like there's a lot of potential here. Um, it's kind of interesting too. Now that I look at it, is that you know this number that we saw, 120,000, um, that's uh, that's quite high, uh, even compared to um, you know some of these numbers, right? Um, that was like uh what we have here with okay. no right head log and um it's like and two shards and 16 threads yeah yeah two shards uh, eight shards and two threads per shard so and 16 oh, total no, threads four shards and 16 threads yeah yeah i'm saying that um uh it's uh in, in that other test it was using eight shards and, and two threads per shard um yeah so it, maybe there's even a little bit. We even get a little bit more out of it if we if we tweak that a little bit. Oh, and three messenger threads as well uh, instead of two. So um, there's there's uh, some differences there, but um, yeah, it definitely we're we're getting we're now starting to get to the point where we're really hitting um, kind of the the OSD limitations in the classic OSD, I think, um, which is why I started wanting to look at this to see if we can push it a little farther. Than where where it can the limit is right now, I I don't think we're going to get a whole lot faster than than like this 125,000 right eye apps unless we um unless we start. Yeah, you know. I think to go over that you really need to re-architect the whole system, which is not worth it because Blue Store sorry because um, Crimson is doing exactly this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm mostly looking to see if there are any any cheap wins that we can get to push it a little further, <laughs> you know, so we give Crimson a little more runway. Yeah, um, the, the head log is definitely a big win, and if you could get rid of the PG log, that would be the second great thing, and then tweaking the number of shards and threads, because you need to re-change settings once everything else is changed. And yeah, exactly. Leave the system be after that. Yeah, we. I I do want to see to look into this contention between the messenger threads and the the TPOSDTP threads. Um, that I think is worth understanding, uh, and maybe there's something that we can do there that that helps and alleviates it a little bit. Um, so that's that's something I'm going to look at. I think, but um, beyond that, though, I mean. There's so many things you could do but that that they're just not worth the effort, right? Yeah, uh, um, uh, yeah. Maybe a snap is the one thing also to investigate. I don't know that it it was maybe it was already investigated because somebody made a very elaborate code to allow for multiple trans uh, object in transact in transaction, but then set the number to two. I'm assuming it was done for a reason. But maybe it was started and then somebody meant to go for this and didn't do the testing. So I don't know. Uh, we we have a yeah, we have a habit of writing elaborate code to allow for very very fine green control of options, and then we just set the default options and then kind of you know that's and, and then just leave it leave it alone. So yeah, I, I would very much encourage you to play with it and see. What the behavior is like when but you change you it. Do you have a benchmark for snapshot deletions? No, not that I know of. Um, 
I don't think we have any benchmarks that really look at the behavior of Snapchat deletions. We have the OMAP stuff that I wrote, um, which you know might give you some idea of like iterator um, behavior or performance or, or you know uh, DB performance in general, uh, but not not anything specific to snapshots. No, but I'm talking about something external. How do I test the cost of snapshot deletion from outside? I don't, I don't, I'm like black box. I don't want to see individual parts just to see. Yeah, no, I don't think we do. So it'd be, it'd be super useful if you want to write one. So meaning we have to generate a snapshot. So you have to write data, generate a snapshot, then keep doing IO and delete one snapshot and see the yeah. impact, see what kind of slowdown you get and see how long it takes for this to complete. Yeah, I, I think the closest anyone has come to something like that is Paul with his tests looking at RBD mirror. I think that's probably the, the best insight we've had into it uh, so far. But it's, it's definitely been something that people have, have talked about a lot, right? Like. Uh, RBD mirroring was not the first time that snapshot deletion overhead has come up. It's, I believe it's also interesting to understand whether uh, the snapshot delete performance relates to the difference uh, between the snapshot, deleted snapshot and the volume. So while you keep, when you keep doing IOs and then do the deletion, you, you, you get farther from more differences between these. It's also interesting, I think, to try to understand the impact without IO, with very few IOs, to see whether snapshot deletion when you don't do IOs, when, when the snapshot is very close to the to the volume, whether it's faster or not. That's from what I know, that, that's the ultimate performance on snapshot deletion, the ultimate performance, uh, it's proportional delete. The, the delete is proportional in time to the, to the difference, to, to the amount that you actually need to delete. Because if eventually you have two snapshot and volume which are identical, the delete should be almost instantaneous because all you do, all you should do is play with metadata. You don't need to do any work on the data because uh, all the records appear twice, all the data is shared, so you don't need to delete any data, so it should be pretty fast. That's the ultimate performance requirement from snapshot deletion. So if you already test this, I think it's worth to test it on this dimension as well. If we generate the same data set and then create snapshot and again generate a second no. data set, and if no, we, you, you, and then we do snapshot deletion, the, and, and generate the third data, data set, then we should have a, apple to apples. I'm not sure I understood you. I, I, I you start what I, I, assuming you have the volume, you create a snapshot. You don't do any IO, then you delete a snapshot then theoretically, you could do it, it should be pretty fast deletion because you don't play with data, only with metadata because no, you I had understand. the volume. I'm saying that that's we shouldn't do that. We should start with a given data set, then create a snapshot and generate data set B. Then <clears throat> close the snapshot, generate data set C and in the background do deletion of the snapshot. If you do the same data set with the same ordering using two different code bases, you would see the difference in performance because they would be dealing with the same snapshot. And then you can measure how many snap objects being deleted per second. Do we have this kind of numbers? I mean, snap object deleted per second? We can add that counters to this. 
But I don't think we do, Gabby. Um, the like, like I was saying before, though, I, I think in the past what we've seen has been that this is really heavily tied to iteration behavior, iteration performance, especially once tombstones end up in the database. Like, um, I don't, I don't remember the snapshot code very well uh, with snapshot deletion, but, um, but I would, I would especially pay attention to anywhere where it looks like we're we're doing iteration, especially during deletions, while we're deleting entries, and and creating tombstones in the database, um, because if we're not also doing writes into the database, we don't trigger compaction, so we end up accumulating tombstones. And so if you're doing like iteration in between deletes, that's probably going to be a really really bad um, uh, pattern for RocksDB. I didn't understand the pattern that you described and why. It's if best. if you if you're deleting entries from RocksDB while you're doing iteration, so like if you're you're iterating and deleting things, um, that creates tombstones that then well like the pattern that we saw before is that we would. We would iterate to a point, we delete some stuff, and then we would reiterate again and start over in the iteration. But now we're iterating over tombstones that were created. Um, and that was really, really bad. We, we saw that RocksDB um, performed extremely badly when that happened until a new compaction happened that got rid of the tombstones. So that's, that would be like the pattern to look for and see if, we, if, that's, if we're doing stuff like that. Well, we do delete in a loop. And are we iterating um, from a certain point over and over again, or do we continue from an old point? No, I, I think, think we move forward. One it, of the, so it, there's two data sets, right? One is the snapshot, which is an OMAP. Then we iterate over all of them based on a given snapshot find all the object, and from that object, we go and find the object node associated with them. And it's, it's possible that this might have gotten changed at some point. Um, I, I vaguely recall maybe that someone fixed it, where maybe we used to iterate from the same point over and over again, and we'd iterate over all the old tombstones, and then someone would do keep track and iterate from the new point. And then, the snap search was starting from the beginning again and again. It might have been. It, that may have been something that got fixed. I don't. I don't remember. But it, that's the kind of thing to watch for. Is what I'm saying. Is like, you know, okay. pay special attention to this kind of thing because that's that's you know, RocksDB hates it. That's a very silly thing to do in any data structures, right? I mean, yeah, works, it's just. You're yeah. going to do, um, instead of doing a linear search, you're going to do a polynomial search. <laughs> yeah, and it's even worse when you're not actually right, deleting deleting things. You're just creating new things to, to iterate over, basically. Actually, you know what? Maybe the problem is that while we iterate over um, OMAP looking for snaps, this thing is not locked. So between every query that we do, you could have another insert. So maybe yeah. Force the iterator to restart? Yeah, that's what I was wondering too, because I, I don't know if you can actually do safely do iteration when you delete things without creating a new iterator. But, but I mean, like <clears throat> the same. So, so snaps, my understanding is that snaps are, are kept in the end table, right? Uh, maybe, I don't remember. So the, the OMA. Yeah. So what we iterate to do deletes, there are other snaps happening, generating new entries for the next snap. They're going to happen in the same mem table or the same table. Yeah, that's quite possible. So the question if the iterator is fixed or if the iterator is being reset every time somebody is doing a modification. Yep, yep, this is exactly the kind of thing to look at. 
Okay, that's something I'm, I need to check. And I don't know where, I, I will try to see if Rogues to be design explain this because that's a real issue to worry about. Yep. I remember once in previous uh, kind of data structures I was building, I built something allow you to do move forward and while insertions could happen, you're not going to reset your turns. <clears throat> they didn't just have to be marked somehow so you, they'll be done later. Sure. It was about freezing into two levels, but it's it's a very tricky thing to do. I don't know if Rocksteady is doing this because if they don't optimize for deletions, which I think they don't, actually they told me specifically that they don't optimize for deletions, then this thing might be a problem. Yeah, and this is not we're not the only people that suffer from this. So it's like you know. Where I think it's fairly well known in RocksDB that this is this is a common issue. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's uh, that's I guess where I'd I'd start anyway. Yeah. Okay. It's a good point. I didn't think about this. Okay. I mean, the code itself, of course, is doing a linear iteration, but if every Time somebody is doing a put operation, the, uh, the iteration is being reset uh, transparently, then that's going to be a very bad thing. Yeah. That might explain <clears throat> why we do things. But actually, if that's the case, I would try and look the main table and try to grab as much as I can in a single iteration. <clears throat> because now what we do is that we take the OMAP, map, find the snap, then go and jump to the object node and find the associated object node. So I wouldn't do that way. <clears throat> I would try and lock the main table, grab as many OMAP snap objects as possible, maybe 10. <clears throat> Under lock, just grab 10 release the lock, and then go and search for the object node, like this. Because even if that means that the iteration going to be reset each time, at least you're going to be doing meaningful amount of work. I would even try to do maybe 20 or 50 <clears throat> under the lock while blocking everybody else from doing things. So you don't need to, I don't know, I don't know what's the number, what's the sweet spot. But probably a better thing to do for works to be would be to allow things to enter the main table, but don't be moved to the right location. Just allow things to go to the right ahead log, set somewhere in the main table, but allow everybody else uh, the, the, to allow, allow the scan to keep on moving. So this thing is not going to be inserted into the right place. That's like the stuff we discussed in the past. Uh, it was your idea about push, putting some kind of a front side cache before the main table. So stuff being entered into the right hand log, but they don't do all the way into the main table. To just stand in front of the main of, of the main table. So that yeah. thing might help in this scenario. Yep. And I still don't know if it's worth all of the work to do that or not. It it would help, I think, a lot with Blue Store and RocksDB in, in this design. But how far we are from C Store and and kind of realistically being able to start using it, I don't know. Hard decisions. There are two grad students. Uh, now they took a project we gave them time to investigate this scenario. So of course the project going to assume best case scenario, <clears throat> no failures whatsoever, they don't have to do that, but just to see if there's any benefit. To this. Sure. If they prove that there's a benefit, then they can move ahead and, and do stuff. But the first thing is just best case scenario, no failures, nothing else. Cool. 
All right. Well, I think we're at the end of the hour here. So uh, any any other last minute things from anybody before we wrap this up? All right. Well then, have a great week, everybody, and uh, see you next week. Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>